Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is 10 to Life, where we talk everything true crime. If you have been following me lately or you are a new subscriber, you see that I have been covering the Cassie Carley case just most recently. And actually, as I was doing a premiere of this case and a summary of this case, I received a lot of new documents that were previously sealed, that are some are still sealed actually, but I got my hands on them. Um, and it really just truly illustrates the timeline and the escalation of the relationship between Cassie and Marcus and how he was increasingly losing control and losing power over her. And you can see all of this because it's outlined in these court documents, these filings, photos, text message exchanges dating all the way back to 2019. And so as I received all of this while my video was premiering, because it feels like there's like new information coming out every single day, I started putting it together and I was like, holy crap, this tells so much more of the story as to the backstory of how we got to this point, what happened, and why it happened. So if you're not familiar with the case and you have absolutely no clue what I'm talking about right now, go take a look at my previous video. I'm going to link it right here. And that's where I break down, start to finish everything we know about the case. So it's like a quick watch. That way you don't have to piece together a bunch of different videos. It's all right there for you. And then come back and take a look at this one. So what we're going to talk about in today's video really is what that timeline looked like. Everything that happened in the court filings, the accusations, the text message exchanges, again, going all the way back to 2019, actually, I think somewhere even 2018, but it's really going to show the tumultuous relationship between Marcus and Cassie. And in my opinion, how, what I believe led us to where we are now and ultimately what happened to Cassie. There are so many pages of these documents. I'm going to flash what I can on screen as we're going, but there are going to be so much more. And at the end, I'll let you know, I'm going to link it all somewhere so that if you want to read all of the court documents yourself, you obviously are more than welcome to. So guys, buckle up and let's get right into it. Sent to life with Annie Elise starts right now. So all of this really starts back in 2018. And on Halloween of 2018, when Sailor was just three months old at the time, Cassie filed for a DV injunction on behalf of herself and Sailor. Now, the content of this injunction was determined that it was sufficient enough to actually grant her a temporary injunction until a hearing was to take place the following month in November. And these injunctions are not easy to get. So if Cassie was able to get one granted, even if just temporarily, there was sufficient cause for it. However, ultimately, one week later, this was dismissed. And this is really the first moment that we see the legal battle between Cassie and Marcus and the dynamic and the power play really start to unfold. So a few months later, in March of 2019, Marcus filed a DV injunction against Cassie's mother, citing that Cassie's mother actually screamed, saying that she had a gun. And in Marcus's filing, he states that during this time in which this altercation occurred, that he was staying some nights at Cassie's home with her and Sailor, and that he felt just inclined and he needed to let the court know what was going on. He also included in this filing, and I'm gonna quote this for you, I've had access to my daughter as much as I would like, even though my daughter lives with her mother, and we have yet to come up with a parenting plan. And again, I'm going to link all these documents later, but when you read through all of this in its entirety, this is where I believe Marcus starts to paint himself as the doting and loving father, saying, I'm trying, I get, to, I'm seeing her as much as I possibly can and as much as I want to, but we still haven't come up with a parenting plan. And now I'm filing this DV injunction against Cassie's mom, the grandmother, and it just gets, it starts to ramp up here, guys, and escalate, and it gets really, really nasty. So two months later, in May of 2019, when Sailor was just nine months old and four days before Cassie's 35th birthday, 
Marcus called DCF to report that Cassie had apparently been abusing Sailor. And some of his allegations included that Cassie had a medical marijuana card, that she drinks excessively. He also said that Sailor had a huge bruise on her forehead and that he didn't believe Cassie when Cassie said that she got that from daycare and when she got it from crawling. So it was just, you know, really painting Cassie in a horrible light. But what's interesting is his call to DCF came right before he filed for full custody of Sailor on May 24th, just two and a half weeks later after he made this call. And this isn't extremely out of the ordinary by any means, because oftentimes a spouse or an ex-partner or a narcissist will go on somewhat of a smear campaign against their ex-partner or their current partner right before they do jump to file for full custody. And they do this hoping to ultimately sway the decision of the court in their own favor. So in this filing for full custody, Marcus states that Cassie has substance abuse problems, that she abuses prescription drugs, illegal drugs, and that she consumes alcohol excessively daily. In addition, he says that Cassie has psychological problems that affect her ability to actually properly care for Sailor on a daily basis. He continues to say that Cassie has made false allegations of DV against him and that she routinely prevents him from seeing Sailor for absolutely no reason. And then he wraps all of this up with a bow, asking that the court enforces supervised visits with Cassie, and none of the visits are to be unsupervised. Petitions like these, and especially petitions in highly tumultuous and high-risk custody cases where the alleging person can essentially say whatever the heck they want. Yes, if it's untrue and it goes to trial, they can ultimately be held accountable for perjury, but really, it's all on public record. They can say whatever they want, whether they sign the affidavit or not, and there isn't really much that you can do about it because it's just their account for the situation. And it's beyond frustrating because then you're forced to show proof that all of these allegations against you are untrue. So just a short time later, on May 29th, that same year in 2019, Cassie was served with these court documents of this filing. And a month later, when Sailor was now 10 months old, there was a new filing, and this was asking for child support from Marcus. So standard procedure in any of these cases allows a 45-day period where you have to give your mandatory disclosures, including financial documents, records, any sort of liabilities that you have. So it's suspected by many, myself included, that the reason Marcus filed this court filing is because he had a pending case for child support against him at the same time. So by filing this against Cassie, he essentially is getting information for all of her finances. He's learning everything. So these filings of his weren't in line with a desperate father trying to save his daughter or worried about her well-being with, you know, in custody with her mother. It was about money. Not only him trying to obtain money from Cassie, but trying to avoid paying money from the previous order. On June 18th, 2019, Cassie retained an attorney and they filed a counter petition. And one of the most important parts of their petition read, it is in the best interest that the court establish a timeshare schedule awarding the respondent, the mother, the majority of the timeshare with the minor child. And what a timeshare agreement is, is basically, you know, a way of saying shared custody. So you come up with an agreement, but the primary care will be held by the mother in this petition that they filed. Cassie also filed her financial affidavit, which detailed every single credit card she had, every statement, every household expense, her income, everything. She was absolutely, completely transparent and forthcoming with all of these filings and doing everything that she was supposed to be doing and showing to the court. Everything that was in line with these frivolous petitions and filings and motions that Marcus was filing. The very next day, on June 19th, Cassie's attorney also filed a request for production of documents against Marcus. But then two hours later, Marcus filed his own request for an amendment to that. So in many high conflict cases, you will see one side consistently filing motions, trying to one up the other side and really drowning them in motions and petitions. And oftentimes this is done in an effort to intimidate the other one, to drown them in legal fees from when they then have to hire their attorney to respond and ultimately trying to get them to drop everything altogether. So that same day that he filed the amendment request, he also filed an objection to a hearing that was taking place on a completely different docket 
of the child support that was initiated from before. And what this meant is that if it was granted, it would essentially delay Marcus from being held responsible for that child support that was due, which is what I believe he was trying to do with this all along. I don't believe it was ever about the actual safety of Sailor or the well-being of his daughter. I think he was trying to get out of paying the previous child support and trying to get out of, you know, the money situation. So just two days before the hearing of the child support on July 8th, Marcus filed his financial affidavit as did Cassie previously. So his mortgage and his rent was claimed to be around $250 and he pays $257 for a phone bill. He also claimed to pay $292 a month on the child's medical and dental insurance policy. But then he also outlines his liabilities, which are hefty and could indicate why he is unable or why he is unwilling to pay child support. So his liabilities that he listed were loans for both his truck and his trailer that totaled to over $70,000, credit cards totaling to over $10,000, and two personal loans totaling to over $3,000, nearly $100,000 of debt. Well, unfortunately for Marcus, just two days later, he was ordered to pay $850 in child support per month with a retroactive amount of $168 per month until the obligation of a total of $5,500 was paid in full and met. So this total came out to over $1,000 monthly. And this was an absolute huge loss for Marcus because not only was he trying to get out of future support, but he was trying to get out of all of the previous support that he owed. So more than a month later, on September 4th, Cassie's attorney filed another motion, and this was to request for production because he believed that Marcus was attempting to hide bank statements and loan documents to, again, continue avoiding paying for child support. And their trial for all of this was scheduled to begin three weeks later. Unrelated to the child support, on September 20th, 2019, at 9 a.m., a hearing was held for Marcus's request for temporary relief based on, you know, his fears for his daughter's safety. And one of the first pieces of evidence that he shows, which this was not related to the child support case, one of the first pieces of evidence he shows was two payments that he made a week earlier, totaling to $2,000 but his balance, remember, was a little over $5,000. So this might have been done in an attempt to show that he was a good father, paying child support as recommended, really, again, trying to get the court to sway on his side. But he also submitted photos to the court. He submitted selfies with Cassie in the hospital, photos of him feeding Sailor with a bottle, really trying to show what a doting and loving father he was. Very personal photos. And this is a tactic that is often done in a lot of these high conflict cases to show what a great parent they are and again, just continue to try to sway the court to make the decision that's in your favor. But what wasn't included in all of these exhibits and evidence that he provided, there were no exhibits provided to prove clear and substantial evidence to his claims that Cassie was ever abusive or mentally unwell or ever took drugs. No evidence included at all to those claims. However, Cassie's exhibits that she entered on the other hand, really illustrated the reality of the situation. And the photos she shared in her exhibits were photos of her home and Marcus's home. And in the photos of Marcus's home, he does not have any personal effects of sailors. He doesn't have a crib. He doesn't have any sleeping area for her. He doesn't have a playpen for her. He doesn't have toys for her, nothing. And this man is asking for full custody of his daughter. He doesn't even have a place for her to sleep. Yet the photos of Cassie's home, on the other hand, show a fully stocked fridge, her toys, her crib, a baby pool on the porch, all sorts of things. By no means a luxury lifestyle, but it definitely illustrates a parent who is involved in their child's life and cares about their well-being and wants to provide for them and has a place for their child to sleep, which Marcus did not. And in the two financial affidavits, Marcus was claiming to make similar income as to Cassie. So there was no excuse as to why he wasn't providing a safe and loving environment for Sailor as was she. And why wasn't he prepared or why wasn't his home prepared if he was trying to take full custody? Why wouldn't he have had toys, a bed and all of these things? It just doesn't make sense. And 
this again just takes me back to I don't think he ever wanted full custody. I think that that was a filing he made just in response to trying to get out of paying child support. So somewhere between that September 20th hearing and October 2nd of 2019, Marcus's attorney submitted a proposed parenting plan to the judge, and this ended up being granted into a temporary shared parenting order. And it was granted on, when was it? On October 2nd, 2019. So this really awarded shared parental responsibility between both Cassie and Marcus, where they were going to communicate by email and text, and then a specific weekend was outlined where Marcus would have Sailor every other weekend, and then he would also have her on Wednesdays after school until approximately 8 p.m. So with this filing that Marcus filed for shared custody, he was essentially abandoning his campaign to get full custody. But again, why would you abandon that if you were so concerned for Sailor's safety? Why would you now propose shared custody? Again, going back to the root of it being about the child support and trying to get out of that. Now here is where things begin to escalate and ramp up. On January 7th, 2020, Marcus's attorney withdrew from the case. And from that point on until literally today, well, maybe not today, but till like a week ago, Marcus was completely pro se, meaning that he was acting as his own attorney, filing all of his own paperwork and representing himself. And then after not having any activity on the docket or any movement from either Cassie or Marcus in over 10 months, the court actually entered an order to close the pending case because there was no movement. But during that entire year that there was no movement legally on paper, Marcus continued to terrorize and make Cassie's life a living hell. So let me read you just a few of these text messages here. So here you can see at the start of this text message, Marcus is saying, listen, I don't have time to be going back and forth on this. Enough with what the attorney said. It doesn't matter what he said. I can take care of her next week. And he has Cassie programmed as Miss Nags a lot in his phone, which it's like, hi, how old are you? It's so embarrassing. So Cassie says, Marcus, I have offered you so many extra days in exchange for this next weekend, and I'm trying so hard to work together and co-parent Sailor. At this point, I'm not going to give you any more extra time since you clearly do not care and do not want to work together with me. Since you just replied that you could take the time off, I will be making sure I change our agreement that when she is sick, you are required to take off work equal to me. I'm done talking about this. Have a good day. To which he responds, I'd be just fine if you would make the days I have her equal to yours. So am I keeping Sailor next week or not? And she says, you work out of town. I'm done talking about this. He says, where I work is my own problem. I need an answer. Am I keeping her next week or not? And she says, I exchanged the weekend of September 20th for the weekend of November 2nd. You should contact your attorney. I don't understand why we can't work together. Clearly, In my opinion, a woman who is trying to co-parent to the best of her ability and find some common ground here to where he is just being very reluctant and making things very challenging. So he responds saying, we didn't exchange. I'm not going to be having an argument about this. You made up your mind. And again, I have no, no saying on the subject. Sorry, his grammar is just horrible. And she says, you had a lot to say so in September when your attorney asked you about it. I'm not trying to go against you. I've been begging you. We have to be a team or the rest of our lives will suck. What do you want from me? And he responds to quit arguing. So perhaps Cassie was hopeful that maybe they could get to a resolution. So she then asks, can we please, please, please work together? I will give you the following weekend too. This just means so much to me. I hope you will find it in your heart to know how much this means to me. Let me know if you would like to see Sailor this weekend. And then he responds to that, this weekend is not my weekend. Next weekend is my weekend. Which it's like, okay, that's great, but she's offering you time with your daughter. And his response isn't like, yes, thank you so much. I would love to see her this weekend. As they're trying to figure this out, he's saying, it's not my weekend. Next weekend's my weekend. Like, give me a break. So she says, I'm offering to share this weekend with you. And then he says, Sailor, my father, and I are going to North Carolina for my nephew's baby shower next weekend. I have told you this for weeks, and I have begged and pleaded for you to work with me. I respect your request about my mother. However, you cannot keep Sailor from her other family members. I'm still extending the offer for you to see her this weekend. I have shared with you the dates and times. I have asked for you to work with me, and I just do not know why you will not. Please let me know if you would like to see her this weekend. Thanks, Marcus. 
Then she goes back and says, I also offered you to join if you are concerned about our safety. Come with us. Again, saying, hey, even if you don't want to see her this weekend and I'm taking her next week, come with us. Hang out with us. Trying to do everything she can to make it a stable environment for Sailor, in my opinion at least. He responds, Listen, I'm getting tired of telling you that I don't want to argue about that. There is judicial order in place that tells us what to do, which that's not what she's saying. And he says, she says, I'm following the order. There is nothing wrong with me offering more time and willing to work with each other. He responds, I'm done talking about this. You made your point and I've made mine and we are not in agreement. If you text me about this again, I'll ignore. Which it's, why is he getting so heated? She's literally just offering him more time with their daughter. Yet he is upset by this. Maybe because he's realizing that he's not angering her, that she is not having the reaction he wanted her to have. I don't know. So then she says, on another note, if you are in town, would you like to have a night or time with Sailor this weekend? And he says, I wasn't planning on being in town since it's not my weekend with Sailor, so I won't be in town. And she responds, okay, it's funny because I offered other weekends that were not your weekends and you were back in Florida as soon as possible for that time. But okay, Marcus, remember, if anything, it's not about you and it's not about me. It's not about my family nor your family. The bottom line is Sailor. What is best for her? I will respect you when it's reasonable. I pray you will do the same in the future for our daughter. She wants us happy. When we are happy, she is happy. She doesn't need any stress or anxiety. We will have to work together. I'm willing to 100%. Have a good night. This just, it makes me so sad reading these two because it just shows that she was such an amazing mother and really only cared about Sailor's happiness and Sailor's well being. So then they go to North Carolina, and you can see here she's sending photos, she's sending videos saying she just wanted to share, she loves her dog, have you given her calamari, she likes it. Then she says, here's a few photos, we're having a great time, we went to the aquarium today, we went to a trick-or-treat at the church across from my sister, and I'm taking her trick-or-treating tonight, she's happy and everything is good, would you like to have her Sunday, Sunday and Sunday night and take her to daycare, I just wanted to offer it to you. And then she sends a few more photos. The only text message he sends her back as she's offering time with their daughter is, don't want an update, don't want you to share. Stop bothering me. Like, what the heck is wrong with this guy? And he never responds to her. So she sends a follow-up text saying, I just wanted to ask again if you'd like to see Sailor tomorrow. We will be back around 9 a.m. You can have her and take her to daycare Monday if you would like. Just please let me know doesn't respond so she follows up one last time hi marcus i'm not sure if you want to have sailor this weekend please let me know if you would like to also i was put to part-time as of today for a few weeks until i find another job my office is closing that being said i can only hope that you will make your payments on time for sailor's needs i appreciate it and then he responds 15 minutes later because now she's mentioning money all before when she's offering him time to see sailor and time to spend time with her he's ignoring her and ghosting her but the second she brings money up he responds within 15 minutes so he says this weekend is your weekend with an exclamation mark again yeah obviously no shit dummy she's trying to offer you time with your daughter so she says i mentioned before i would give you my weekend when we got back if you don't want it that's perfectly fine but the daycare is closed on monday the 11th can you watch her and he says i didn't agree to an exchange as far as the 11th if you can't watch her i can but i wouldn't be able to return her to you before the following weekend and she says she can't miss daycare for a week. And he says, why can't she? She just did last week with you when they went to North Carolina. And she responds saying, I'm not sure why you would have to keep her for the whole week. She is allowed three days a month without a doctor's note. Also, I'm not sure who you're going to let watch her while you work during the week because he has to go to work and I believe also works out of town. And he says, well, you asked if I could keep her, so I've answered to you what I can do. And Cassie responds, I'm going to need help on days that daycare is closed or when she's sick. It's not fair for me to put my job in jeopardy because you work out of town and can't help. Who would be watching Sailor the whole week that you would take her? And then she quickly realizes that's not even an option because Sailor can't miss that much daycare. And so she says, never mind, it doesn't matter because she can't miss more than three days without a doctor's note. So now it's all on me again. I'll make sure she's taken care of on the 11th. Do you want her Friday or Saturday for one night this weekend? Question mark. And then he responds, I'm not taking any time in exchange for anything. If you can't handle her, you make it clear that that is the reason why you want me to take care of her. I mean, this guy is just like such a freaking piece of work. So now he's telling her, basically, if you can't take care of her, just say it. If that's why you want me to have time with her, just say it, that it's really because you can't take care of her. She's too much for you. 
That's not what's happening. She's trying to co-parent and she's offering you time to spend with your daughter, but he's trying to spin it and put it back on her saying, okay, you're not doing this just to be kind. You're not doing this because you just want to offer time with me and Sailor. You're doing this because you can't handle her. It's such a like manipulation and gaslighting tactic and it's really trying to deflect from the situation that he does not want to spend that time with his daughter, which is horrible. So he's instead trying to put it on Cassie as though it's her fault and her wrongdoing. So now going back to the court filings and the case, and at the time that the court actually had filed to essentially close their case, Marcus then filed to contest the action of his license being suspended for non-payment of the child support. And then Cassie ended up having to file an emergency pickup order because he apparently held Sailor from Cassie, didn't disclose her information or where she was, and didn't get in contact with her. And Marcus was apparently supposed to return Sailor to Cassie on July 11th, 2021. And he didn't. He went two weeks without returning her. The day after he was supposed to return Sailor to Cassie on July 12th, 2021, Marcus filed six motions. He filed a motion to dismiss. He filed a motion of psychological evaluation asking the court to do a psych eval on Cassie. He filed a motion for temporary custody where he again asked for full custody, but he wasn't attaching any exhibits or evidence as to why. He filed a motion for a cease and desist saying that Cassie can never say his name again. And then he also filed a motion for a case transfer asking for the case to be moved to Santa Rosa County. Lastly, he files a motion to request daycare attendance, alleging that Cassie intentionally kept Sailor out of daycare so that the daycare wouldn't notice and report any bruises on her. Now, we, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Filing several motions like these are the signs of someone who is losing control and starting to spin and again, trying to tie them up in the legal system. So now back to court they go. Just a few days later, on July 29th, he filed seven more motions for civil contempt. Just look at all of these filings, guys. There are so many of them, back to back. And this is, again, oftentimes done just to an attempt to bury the other in legal fees and essentially intimidate them into dropping the case entirely. And because Marcus was pro se, as he was filing all of these, he was doing it all himself, which meant it was absolutely no financial burden to himself. And he could essentially drain Cassie it's really a power play move, in my opinion. Somebody who needs control, who's trying to just intimidate you and bury you and file all of these things over and over to where your head is just spinning and you're like, I need to just throw in the towel. But Cassie never did because she wanted to do what was best for Sailor. So on August 4th, 2021, Cassie's attorney filed a 31-page motion of contempt against Marcus. He had refused to give Sailor back to Cassie on that exchange day, and he also took Sailor to a mental health professional without notifying Cassie, and he didn't allow Cassie to communicate with her, he didn't communicate with her on the time-sharing plan, and he had kept Sailor for nearly two weeks without Cassie knowing where she was. So after this was filed, the court issued a hearing for October 1st, 2021. Now, what's interesting is before this hearing, back in September, Marcus actually also, in his huge slew of filings, had filed a motion to reinstate his passport in his child support docket case. Now, Marcus has dual citizenship with Brazil and the U.S., and in my last video, we talk about a very interesting comment that his mom had made on the days, I think it was the day before Cassie had gone missing. She had left a comment on his Facebook on a a video he had posted of him and Sailor at the beach where she says that she was counting down the days and the minutes until they were reunited. Now on that video, I mentioned that that comment didn't sit right with me and that it felt almost that he was possibly going to be going to Brazil because it's his mom who's located in Brazil. Why would she say that if there were no plans of Sailor ever going to Brazil and Cassie wasn't planning on taking her? And now that we see a filing that he was trying to reinstate his passport with that dual citizenship, it makes me wonder even more. Was he truly building a plan to essentially abduct Sailor and take her to Brazil? And that same day that he had filed this, he also filed that motion to dismiss all of his child support payments. It seems super suspicious to me, not to mention his reasoning for the child support dismissal. And he cited that the current child support order was unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. Okay, Marcus, okay. 
So you're trying to get your passport reinstated. You're trying to dismiss all your child support payments. What are you really doing here? What's the plan? What's the game plan here? So around this same time, Cassie created a GoFundMe. And this, I can only assume, is to help with all these legal fees that he was really drowning her in. And part of the description in this GoFundMe read, Like so many relationships I know, I was swept up in hidden deceit known as charm. This man was a master at the game of manipulation, and though I could see all of the warning signs of an abuser, I believed his excuses and became stuck in his web of narcissistic lies. Just months into the relationship, I discovered that I was pregnant. During my pregnancy, this man's abusive control and manipulation escalated, but having battled infertility in my first marriage, I desperately wanted a family, so I justified his erratic behavior as long as I could. By the grace of God and great friends, I chose to end the relationship with him. He's filed dozens of false police reports. He calls CPS so many times that I know nearly all of them by name. To date, he owes me over $10,000 in support. A few weeks ago, due to child support delinquency, the state was set to suspend his driver's license. Just days after that notice, he called CPS to report yet another false claim. He was allowed to pick up my daughter that day for his regularly scheduled weekend visit. For over two weeks, I had no contact with my daughter or knowledge of her whereabouts. I called everyone I knew. I sought help from local police and every government agency I knew. No one could or would help me. Truly, in my opinion, just a desperate plea for help from a mother who is really trying to do right by her daughter and this man who is stonewalling her every step of the way. And on October 25th, 2021, the court ordered that all of Marcus's motions were completely denied. And that order also put into effect that the Walmart in Destin would now be the official exchange spot going forward when they were exchanging custody. And also, lastly, Marcus was ordered to pay attorney fees. So on January 14th, 2022, this is where we start to kick into what's happening now as we are in April. Cassie's attorney filed an affidavit for those attorney fees and for the costs. And on March 18th, a few weeks ago, the court ordered Marcus to pay almost $6,000 in attorney fees and gave him 30 days time to pay it. This was in addition to the child support fees that he still owed. And just nine days later, after this was ordered by the court, Cassie went missing. So this again, this whole timeline of the court filings, the back and forth, what his motions were that he was filing, everything just shows me that Marcus is a narcissist and that this was all about control and that this was all about money and really him not wanting to pay any money. I don't believe it was ever for one single second about his daughter, not once. I don't think he was ever concerned about her well-being. I think if he was concerned about her well-being, he would have taken all of those opportunities that Cassie was extending to him to see her on non-weekends of his. If he want, if he cared about her well-being, he would seize every single opportunity possible. If he cared about his daughter, period, he would seize every opportunity to see her possible. But instead, he was responding saying, no, it's not my weekend. If you can't handle her, just say it. No, no, don't send me these updates. I don't care. I'm not concerned. So he, I don't believe he ever once filed any of these, not a single motion on behalf of his daughter. I believe it was all about the money because we also know he was about a hundred grand in debt. And so now with these big ticket child support and court fees totaling up to tens of thousands of dollars, he's drowning even more financially. And on my last video, I also had mentioned that I believed that that may have been why Cassie went missing and ultimately was recovered um, and had been murdered was so that he wouldn't have to ever pay any future child support payments, you know, go forward in the future. And now that I've seen all these court documents, it really just cements that theory for me. So there are tons and tons of pages of these documents. I showed you guys some of these on the screen, but there are so many more. I'm going to upload them all onto my Patreon in case you want to read them because YouTube won't allow me to put everything here, not only because of some of the words that are in the court documents, but just because of how big it is as a file in general. And I'll put it on the absolute lowest tier, which I think is a dollar so that everybody can access it essentially. Um, So if you want to read all the documents yourself and see everything verbatim, go head over there and you can have access to all of that. I'm also going to link the GoFundMe here for Cassie's family because, as you can imagine, they are not only still trying to pay 
court fees as they're trying to gain custody of Sailor, but they have a long road ahead of them, not only for the well-being and life and taking care of Sailor, but for funeral expenses, for any sort of other legal avenues they're going to pursue, whether it's, you know, a private investigator, a private autopsy, who knows what, what, what they may need to do. But in any event, I'm going to link their GoFundMe here in case you feel inclined to donate to them. We still don't have a cause of death. We still don't have the autopsy results and we still don't have an actual motive voiced from Marcus himself because the only word he has actually said is lawyer. So I believe that there are going to be a lot more details in the coming days, probably even by the time I upload this video, if I'm going to be quite honest with you, because that seems to be what the trend is. Every time I record, something new comes up and I go right back in front of the camera. So I'm going to keep you guys updated. So make sure if you haven't subscribed yet, you hit subscribe and turn your notification bell to on. That way you will be notified as soon as an update gets posted in this case. And please leave your supportive comments below for Cassie's family, for everything that they're going through, and just please continue to keep them in your thoughts and prayers as well. And let's hope that Marcus is held accountable and that Cassie gets the justice she deserves and that Sailor gets the justice she deserves because she has now been robbed of having a wonderful mother and a wonderful life. For what? Over $10,000? Over some money? Over a selfish narcissistic man? Like, how does that even how do you even reconcile that in your mind that somebody would go to these measures because of that? It's horrible. So I'll keep you guys updated. Again, make sure to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please give this video a thumbs up on your way out. It helps the algorithm, which in turn helps push Cassie and Sailor's story out to more people and hopefully will help them in the end get the justice that they so desperately deserve. Thanks for tuning in with me today, guys. Until the next case, stay safe.